So welcome to the next um, passage in 1 Corinthians. You remember that last week we had a we had a lovely message from Andy on 1 Corinthians 3 and he dealt with the first nine verses of that great chapter. I'm moving on from there this week and there are three things in the passage that I want to bring to you which I hope will be of interest to you. Um, the first is in verses 10 to 15 and that's Paul talking about the church of Jesus Christ as a building. The second, and this will be very brief, is in the two verses following 16 to 17 where Paul talks about the church as a temple. And then finally, in the last few verses, 18 to 23, Paul talks about the church as, and I'm really sorry about this title, um, but it's the best I could think of. Paul talks about his church as the fellowship of the foolish. That's awful, isn't it? Forgive me for that, please. So we'll start with verses um, 10 to 15, the church as a building. Um, last week, Andy preached on those first nine verses of the chapter. And um, one of the things that came over was the importance of understanding that different people under God have different ministries within his church. So Andy read verses six through to eight. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Now, as we come into the second half of the chapter, Paul changes his metaphor and he gives us fair warning in that last verse of last time's talk on 1 Corinthians 3. In verse 9 it says, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So he's been talking about fields, now he's talking about buildings. But actually, his subject hasn't changed one little bit. He's still addressing the question of church unity. And he builds upon the idea that of being rewarded according to a Christian's labor. So let's read the first part of my passage, verses 10 to 15. According to the grace of God given to me, like a, mas like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, as, but only as through fire. So here we are then, the church is a building, and Paul is talking about the church starting with the most important part of the church. Last year, it seems like a whole lifetime ago, back in, I think it was February, Maggie and I went to Barcelona. We'd never been before, but we wanted to go for ages. And we got one of these really cheap last minute four, I think four days holiday in that great city. Um, and we had a great little hotel, just about two minutes walk from uh, the most famous street in the whole of the city, a place called Las Ramblas, that I'm sure many of you have seen. But the highlight of the whole trip for me was that one day we went to a place called the Basilica 
to la sagrada familia now apologies to all you spanish-speaking people there i'm sure i've pronounced that all wrong but anyway a basilica is like a cathedral but you couldn't call this place a cathedral because they already had one of those and you can't have two catholic cathedrals in one city apparently who knew but anyway i went to the basilica de la sagrada familia and it took my breath away it was the most impressive building i've ever seen in my life oh if you've never seen it go online and have a look at this place it's amazing from the outside it was awe inspiring the towers the carvings in stone gargoyles all that sort of thing and and, and then we went indoors oh wow the stained glass windows were just inspiring yellows and blues and greens and the sun shining through them and well i will never forget that day when we went to that building but i tell you what <laughs> as i walk around that edifice uh, both outside and inside i have to confess that not once did it cross my mind to say wow this place must have incredible foundations it never went through my head for a minute i have to confess and yet paul begins his discourse on the church in this particular passage talking about the foundation and let me tell you the church of jesus christ is far more beautiful than the sagrada familia and he talked about the foundations of the church and saying that the foundation the one true foundation is jesus christ but he also said i laid a foundation do you remember back at the very beginning of all this when i had the privilege of introducing this book i read verse two and it said there to the church of god that is in Corinth hmm. it's not the church of Corinth it's the church of God that is in Corinth but Paul here says I laid a foundation like a skilled master builder I laid a foundation so is Paul actually claiming some sort of credit for the church in Corinth is he making a claim if you like for a stone somewhere saying this foundation was laid by Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus. Now, of course, he's not far from it. Look at the first words of the passage that I've got this week. And those first words are these, according to the grace of God given to me. He then goes on to say that the foundation of this building, the church, and incidentally that also includes every component part of the church that is you and me that foundation is christ so this is the church of god in corinth the immovable foundation of which is jesus christ the foundation was laid by paul but even that was only because of the grace of god given to him let me put it another way just about halfway through the first century after christ a church was founded in a city called corinth it wasn't the church of corinth it was the church of god in corinth it was founded by a man called paul yet he wasn't in any sense the foundation of that church the foundation of that church was the son of god jesus christ paul labored hard to build the church yet it wasn't his wisdom or hard work or preaching or teaching or power or personality that established it it was the grace of god do you see it's all of god there is little of mankind here though certainly god used men and women but they worked according to the grace of God given to them, just as Paul did. And I'm sure 
you can guess where I'm going to go now. In the early 21st century after Christ, a church was founded in a place called Trevethin. It wasn't the church of Trevethin or Pontypool or Gwent or Pontywenith. It was the church of God. And it remained the church of God wherever it traveled. It was founded by a man called Di, soon joined by a man called James, yet they were in no sense the foundation of that church. The foundation of Hill City Church was and is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Di and James labored hard to build the church, yet it wasn't their wisdom or hard work or preaching or teaching or power or personality that established it. It was the grace of God. It was all of God. It is all of God. And I want to say to you that the matters that were central to the health of the church in Corinth must always remain central to the health of the church to which we belong. The word of God, the centrality of good teaching, the unity of the believers bound together in cords of love, an urgent desire to serve the community in which God has placed us, primarily by sharing the good news of Christ's atoning death and resurrection, the importance of living holy lives that are pleasing to God, loving God and loving others in the light of God's love. And this, never forgetting this, the foundation of who we are as a church and who we are as individual Christians is not ability or money or tradition or other people's opinions of us. Our foundation is Christ. And what a solid foundation he is. Everything a church does is sanctified and made holy when its foundation is Christ. The visual trappings of the church may alter, but while the foundation remains Christ, actually nothing changes. The people will with the passing of time, yet the church will not because the foundation is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The strength of the church, the authority of the church, the purity of the church, the beauty of the church, the life of the church, the power of the church, and the glory of the church is Jesus Christ, our foundation stone, the rock upon which we as a church and we as individuals stand. And let me warn you, ladies and gentlemen, that if we ever move from that foundation, we step onto sand and we will sink. Yet, Paul talks not just about the foundation, Jesus Christ, he also talks about what is built on that foundation, the superstructure, if you like, that which is built above the foundations. And he likens it to things precious, gold, silver and precious stones, and things mundane, wood, hay and straw. Now, I don't think he's drawing a distinction here between right things and wrong things, or between holy things and sinful things. I think his distinction is between things that last and things that soon degrade. He's talking about our works, the things we do and what motivates us to do them. Let me remind you that if our foundation is Christ, if we're saved by the blood of Christ, then our salvation is utterly secure, eternally so. 
and in no way do our works or even the lack of them affect our salvation or make us more worthy of that salvation. Our salvation does not depend on our worthiness or upon what we build, but upon Christ's worthiness as the foundation of our faith. And here, in these verses, we meet three different labourers who will one day face God. I'll deal with the last one first. He's in verse 16. Uh, this is very brief. In verse 16, it says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Ladies and gentlemen, we are God's temple. If our sins are forgiven, if we believed on Christ and accepted him as our saviour, we are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in us. Hallelujah. The fact is not dependent upon the question of whether our works are gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay or straw. Why not? Because our foundation is Christ and we stand in his righteous, not in our weakness. We are God's temple built on the foundation of Christ's work on the cross and God's temple is holy and we are that temple. Can I ask you a question this morning? Do you feel very holy today? I have to say, I don't in all honesty. I've spent far too much of my Christian life building with wood, hay and straw, far too little building with gold, silver and precious stones. But the truth is that if our church's foundation is Christ, our church is God's temple. If the foundation of our life is Christ, we are God's temple and we are holy. Not because there's any good thing in us, but because we are rooted in the holiness of Christ. And this verse that I just read to you underlines the fact that if anyone works against God's church or against his people, he will be judged and condemned by God unless he repents. The future judgment, certain and inescapable for the unrepentant sinner is a fearful thing. But for those who build on the foundation of Christ, whether they build with gold, silver or precious stones, wood, hay or straw, judgment is wholly different. We are saved. We are redeemed. We are made holy. We are secure in our salvation. So now I need to read a couple of verses again, from verse 12 to the end of 15. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. I just noticed as I was looking through the sermon again this morning that it says wood, it says uh, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. There's no ore there. I would have expected to to say wood, hay or straw, but it doesn't. And that made me think, well, does that really mean that actually all of us through our lives as Christians tend to build with more than one thing? I'm, I'm not sure it's worth looking at that again, but certainly looking back at my life, 
maybe uh, there's been a, 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 a little variety in what I've built with, let's say. So the thing I want to say is a few things. Firstly, that the word day in verse 13 has got a capital D in my version and it doesn't refer to daylight when the beginning of the day comes about. It's talking about the day, the day when Jesus returns again. The day which for all of us upon who have built upon the foundation of Christ will be a day of great and wonderful joy. Secondly, the second it in verse 13 may refer to the work or it may refer to the day. I think it probably refers a little bit to both, but let me read you that again. Um, the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Does the it refer to the day or to the works? I'm not sure. Thirdly, and much more importantly, please understand that it's not our salvation that is in jeopardy here. Uh, a wrong reading might give that impression. It's our works that are being examined, not our salvation, because works have no place in ascertaining whether we're saved. We're saved by faith, not by works. The injunction in Acts 31 is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the result of that faith is, you will be saved. It's not equivocal. It's not perhaps. It's not maybe. It's will be saved. Our salvation is not conditional on our works, but upon faith. Our faith is utterly secure. It's the second time I've said that. The issue here is the works that are the fruit of our salvation and not just the works themselves, but also the motivation for our work. You see, this is personal. It's not general, it's personal. And it's not as easy as putting great preaching in the gold column and cutting the church grass in the straw. I don't know if you see what I've done there, putting the church grass in the straw, but never mind. It's not that easy because, as I said before, motivation does come into this. So, to give you an example, if I may, great preaching. So Andy, James and Simon, I put that in alphabetical order, put their headphones on and preach a great sermon week by week. It's, it's hypothetical, but it's realistic, isn't it? God has called them to preach. They're faithful to the scripture. And their earnest desire is to glorify God and introduce men, women, and children to Christ. Is this silver or is it straw? <laughs> yes, of course. Put in those terms, those three saints are building on the foundation of Christ and their works are precious. They are gold. Next week, it's my turn. I put my headphones on and I preach a great sermon. Hypothetical again and perhaps nowhere near as realistic, you might think. But suspend your disbelief for a moment or two. What if I preach that great sermon yet God hasn't called me to preach? What if I preach my preconceived ideas using scripture to back up my theories and not God's truth? What if actually underneath it all my earnest desire is for your praise or financial reward or personal glory? Even though my sermon might be the best I've ever preached, even though, and this is totally ridiculous, even though I were to preach the best sermon that's ever been preached in Hill City in Hill City Church, would it be silver or would it be straw? It would be straw. If I mow the grass, however, out of a genuine desire to serve the church, and even if nobody notices, or if I pour the coffee and nobody bothers to say thank you, but it's done because I really want to serve God's people, or if I clean the toilet and disinfect the chairs out of a genuine desire to make people feel safe and secure and 
even if everybody takes those things for granted? You tell me. Silver or straw? Silver. You see, it's not for me or you to assess whether works are gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay or straw. That's God's decision to make on that day which will be revealed by fire. Why? Because only God knows the heart. Only God knows what's going on in my mind. He's the only one qualified and with the authority to judge fairly. It's not for man to make leagues of what's good and what is straw. And our works will be judged by fire. That which is temporary of little lasting worth will be burnt away and my darkest motivation will be illuminated and revealed. That which is precious and which is lasting will equally be revealed but will not be affected by the most intense of fire. And these verses make it clear that rewards and wages will be apportioned according to our works. Those whose works are shown to be gold will receive rewards, it says in verse 14. And verse 8 that Andy read last week, it says there that each will receive his wages according to his labour. Those whose works are wood, hay or straw will suffer loss of wages and loss of rewards, but they will still be saved the third time their salvation is secure. This is a testing fire rather than a purifying one. And I repeat that our salvation is not at stake here. Our wages and rewards, our crowns are. And so in our final four or five minutes, we reach our final few verses and Paul returns to his glorious theme of chapter one, the fellowship of the foolish. The church in Corinth is riven with division and as a result of intellectual pride and spiritual arrogance, Paul may, finds it necessary to make it clear in these verses that the people's judgment is flawed and their thinking foolish and as a result they're damaging the church. Let no one deceive himself, says Paul in verse 18. If anyone among you thinks that he's wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it's written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. These verses are all about church unity on one level at least. If you think you're better than others because of your intellectual acumen, your qualifications, your achievements, think again, says Paul. You might be brilliant scientists or philosophers or teachers or professors, highly respected in your field of expertise, but in the things of God, you are foolish. You may think yourself better than anyone else, top of the heap because of who you know or which club you've joined, but actually you're missing out on so much. For those of you who make Christ their foundation, who are building on that foundation which was laid by Paul, who trust in the things of God rather than the things of man, you need to appreciate just how blessed you are. So let no one boast in men for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And best of all, you are Christ. And why is that so wonderful? Because Christ is God's. And with this, Paul lands it. He nails it. You think you're so 
privileged because you're intellectual. You think you're so blessed because you associate with the right crowd. You think you've got everything sorted, yet your vision is so small, so foolish. So to those who boast in God, not in man, to those who are wise in the things of God, to those who trust in him, the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. You are Christ and Christ is God's. Ladies and gentlemen, I've struggled with how to end this sermon. I couldn't work how to, as I used to say, land the plane. Last night before I went to sleep, I asked God to tell me what to say. And this morning I woke with one phrase going over and over and over in my head. And I guess it's been something of a thing this morning. The words were these. Your salvation is secure. Your salvation is secure. Your salvation is secure. I've been a Christian since I was 15. In nine days, I will have been a Christian for 54 years. 19,715 days. Thank you, Google. If I put my faith in wealth or qualifications, I would not have been secure. If I put my faith in Confucius or Buddha or Muhammad, I would not have been secure. But I put my faith in Christ and my salvation is secure and that fact has been utterly true for 19,715 days my salvation is secure in him because I am Christ he is my savior he is my foundation I am Christ and Christ is God's. I want to recommend him to you this morning, whoever you are listening to this, please, for the sake of your very soul, make him your saviour too. Who knows, at the far end of your life, you too may wake up one day with this incredible thought, my salvation is secure. God bless you.